Okay. Uh, okay. My name is Seokwon. Uh, uh, I'm from Korea. So uh, as you hear my pronunciation, English is not my mother tongue, and uh, I'm bad at in English. But this time I have to deliver my message in English. So please bear with me, with my Korean English, uh, and probably Joy can help me if I. You know, do miss something in English. Probably I can speak in Korean and Joey can translate in English. Anyway, so uh, I'm a WEC missionary uh, from 2005. Uh, as uh, uh, Jeff introduced me, I was in Central Asia, Kazakhstan, for a good number of years uh, as a church planter uh, at, in Muslim context. And uh, I was uh, kind of appointed as a mobilizer and trainer in uh, Southeast Asian countries. So I came to Thailand in 2016 and uh, I'm teaching at Karen Bible School and this is one of the job that I do, but actually I do it not as a teacher or professor, I do it as a mobilizer, mission mobilizer. So I give uh, some mission lectures there and uh, this time I'm very glad to be here to be with you, uh, to share about my experience and my perspective and some of the le lectures that you might find interest. And this lecture will be uh, combined with devotional, uh, with the uh, uh, thinking of uh, Bible passage, also some theological perspectives on mission. So, uh, uh, I hope that this time that we can learn together as a community and as a group. And uh, there are good number of students here that uh, combine together with first and second and third year students. So I'm so glad to be uh, you know, with you that you can give some variety uh, you know, perspective from different countries and different uh, uh, point of view that you can see uh, from your own cultural background, from your own understanding anyway. Uh, is time limited, so uh, I will start my lecture with the first lecture that uh, I, I'm given for 40 minutes, and uh, I hope that I can, you know, uh, manage <laughs> for this. Okay, I, sh I will share my uh, presentation with you. Okay, so uh, this time I want to do uh, rethinking of Matthew 28, 16 to 20. And this is what we know, uh, the Great Commission. And subtitle of this, uh, you know, the first lecture is Certainty in Uncertainty, uh, combined together with uh, global mobilizing, uh, global mission mobilizing and my own, own experience. Okay, so you see the presentation clearly, yeah? Okay, so now we are living under pandemic. And world is changing rapidly. Uh, we have never thought about, you know, giving lessons on online, but we are doing this. And even though we have some distance, I'm in Thailand now, you are in Korea, uh, but we are still connected. Uh, so we are uh, uh, living in very uh, different, you know, uh, time. And uh, this is what I really feel that uh, everybody is having uncertainty in their future. As I share with one of the students here in this room, uh, the, uh, you know, the senior, he's graduating. And I was asking, what is his, your future plan? And he is not sure, he's praying about it. Sure, everybody is uncertain about their future, even for tomorrow, even today. And this uncertainty gives some fear. And this is what everybody, are having some experience. But you know what? The Bible actually gives certainty, especially uh, when we are looking at the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. And we see, we know by heart that Jesus was giving this uh, you know, uh, word to us. And he is promising that I am with you always to the very end of the age. And he is giving this authority to us to go and to uh, you know, preach the gospel and making disciples for all nations. And this is what actually we see in uh, Revelation chapter seven, nine. 
This is the end of the time that what God is, you know, preparing for all people. And this is what I want to read together. After this, I looked. And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and wore holding palm branches in their hands. This is what the picture that we have, you know, God is the missionary God. He began his mission from, the gen, uh, from Genesis until Revelation, till the very end of the age. You know, this is what we'll see. It's a clear picture that God will do something for his mission and he will accomplish. This is what we know. And this is so certain and so sure. This is what we have certainty in the Bible. And everybody say amen. But this is my challenge. There is some omission in the Great Commission. We are neglecting something. We are missing something in the Great Commission. This is what actually verses 16 and 17. And without verses 16 and 17, I say this is not the full package of the Great Commission. Just thinking about Great Commission, you know, when you are sending missionaries uh, in the church, you are missionary there. You know, you are invited as a missionary. The church wants to send you. But you know what? If you are not there in that, in that church, what happens to the Great Commission? It will never happen because there is no missionary who are sent, sent by. And this certainty from uh, verses 18 to 20 was given to the context of 16 and 17. And this is what, what I want to read. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubt. You know, the full package, for, for example, if you buy a computer and you're expecting that everything is in the box and you, know, you bring it to home and you, know, you want to re-unboxing uh, re, uh, and you found out that the adapter is missing. You know, you have a computer, but there is no adapter. What happens to the computer? Can you use it? No, you cannot use it because you don't have any power. This is a full package. When we're thinking about the Great Commission, we are not just talking about uh, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. We need to include this 16 and 17. And this is what I want to look at now closely with you. 16 and 17. The 12, 12 uh, the 11 disciples and Galilee and mountain and the people, they have some doubt. They didn't believe Jesus Christ. You see, the certainty of Great Commission was given to uncertainty. And I will exp explain you what uncertainty that they have. Number one, uncertainty. People, the 11, and their heart attitude, doubt. Actually, uh, number 12 is a significant number in the Bible. Number 12 is called governmental perfection. You see the example of 12 di di tribes of Israelites and 12 disciples. And new heaven in G Revelation is a described often with number 12 made for perfection and fullness. For example, 12 doors in heaven, 12 precious stones, 12 angels, and the new Jerusalem is size of 144 cubics, which is uh, 12 by 12 cubics. And we know that Jesus, he prayed hard and choose only for 12 disciples with a purpose. And 12 is a something that is very meaningful and significant. However, now this great commission was given to 11, which is imperfect. And some of them, do not have faith. They couldn't believe Jesus when he was giving this certainty, the great commission. He wanted to send his disciples to all nations to make disciples, but they couldn't believe this. This is uncertainty. And number two, uncertainty, place, a mountain in Galilee. Mountains are place to experience God's presence, a new beginning, and a spiritual formation with new challenges. For example, like mountain Mori in Genesis about the Abraham that he had the experience of 
of, of, of God. Mount Sinai in Exodus, Moses, Mount Carmel in uh, First Kings, and Sermon on the Mountain. Those mountains are, you know, holy place, and they are experiencing new God's presence. But you know what? It's a mountain. You know that Jesus was died on the cross in Jerusalem. You know, people saw Jesus is dying, dying there on the cross. And people mocked him and people, you know, kind of giving him temptation. Get down. You know, you're the son of God. You have ability. But Jesus didn't. He died on the cross in Jerusalem. Just imagine that Jesus resurrected in Jerusalem and showed himself that he is a risen God. People will be amazed. People will be astonished. People will be surprised to see Jesus if they could see with their eyes. But Jesus didn't. He called his disciples to mountain to give the great commission. Mountain, there is no witnesses. There are no people, only disciples. You know, if it's a good news, why not in the big city like Jerusalem where he died? Why not there? And just thinking about that time of Roman Empire, you know, when Roman Empire, you know, he's sending his army to, uh, to go war, you know, he's a sending, uh, you know, commission like, or launching commission. You know, when, you know, Roman soldiers going for war, you know, you know, they are not just, you know, lonely wolves, you know, they are not just going there. There are people, you know, on the street and they are cheering up. They are giving claps and they are shouting, go for war, we'll be behind of you. And people, you know, the soldiers will be challenged and will be, you know, encouraged, will be passionate for their, you know, uh, you know their, their commission. But here in this time, when Jesus was commissioning his disciples, there was no disciple, there was no you know, witnesses. There were no people around, only disciples and Jesus. Would you like that? If you want to go, if you are a missionary who are commissioned to go to the world mission, there is no, you know, church members gathering around and, you know, praying for you. No? Would you like that? And what about mountain, the location in Galilee? Galilee is one of the rural areas. And you know, uh, Nazareth, you know, is one of the cities in Galilee. And we know that John 3, 40, uh, 46, Nazanael said, Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. And is there anything good from there? And he's saying, you've got to be kidding. No, no, nothing good there in Galilee and mountain. Everything is uncertain. And this certainty was given to uncertainty. 11 disciples, mountain, Galilee, Tao, and the Great Commission. It's not a good combination. And we see this certainty mission was given to uncertainty. And what happened, you know, as Jesus promised there was Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses, sure. And we see Acts 2, 41. Those who accepted his message, Peter was preaching. And what happened? There, 3,000 were added to their numbers. They believed in Jesus. Hooray. Yes, good. Certainty works, surely. But what happened? Soon after, there was a great persecution broke out against the church and all the members except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Again, uncertainty. Certainty and uncertainty. Certainty and uncertainty. And you know the Bible is a full story, full of stories of certainty and uncertainty. I will share you in the Old Testament. God's mission began from the creation God created man and woman, yet what happened? They disobeyed. God saved Noah's family, yet people built a Babel tower. 
God called Abraham to be a blessing, yet Israel misunderstood the meaning of blessing. God reminded again and again his blessing to the judges, king, through prophets, yet few followed and many and many had failed. Old Testament finished with 400 years of silence. God started with his mission, yet this mission was given to uncertainty in the Old Testament. What about New Testament? The New Testament began. God sent his only son as he promised, yet people did not welcome Jesus. But we are sure that Jesus, you know, he is the God and son of God. Jesus lived the heart like a servant. He died as he promised with love and resurrected with glory as he said. Yet what happened? Jesus, he gave this certainty with a full picture to his disciples, yet people could not and did not believe Jesus. What about Jesus' disciples. His disciples took in the Great Commission, yet almost everyone were imprisoned and put into death. After all, we know Apostle Paul, great missionary to Gentiles. In Romans, and at the end of the chapter, he was imprisoned and he was murdered. Revelation, we know this book, you know, there's a picture, bright picture that God will accomplish his mission that we read, 7-9. You know what? Revelation was written by John, who was in exile at Patmos. And I, I'm wondering, when people read this book, if they could believe this message, because this message was written by John, who was exiled at Patmos and he was vulnerable, no power. God's people lived for the certainty of God's mission, yet they still had to live with uncertainty. This is what I see in the Bible. Certainty in, the uncer certainty in uncertainty. And we see in the history of mission, there is a book called The 25 Unbelievable Year, written by Ralph Winter. And in this book, we see with the end of World War II and the end of Western colonial rules, the Western missionary agencies began to look pessimistically at the movement of world mission. Numerous missionaries were deported and missionary activities in the ministry were stopped. Churches which were still weak, young, would soon disappear, and mission works would end very soon to Westerners' eyes. However, alike, their despair. Non-Western missions did not decline. At a time when the work of Western missionaries seemed to cease, between 1945 and 1969, non-Western missions overturned everyone's expectation and a surprising change took a place. At that time, the initiative of world mission were transferred from the West to the non-Western. God's mission is not conducted by human expectation and experience and knowledge, but by God himself, that's what I see. And for that mission, God calls on his servant who seems so weak First understanding of weakness is truly remarkable in terms of God's glorious mission call. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10, it says, I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become from the message. Can I do missions? This is a question from my dear friends from Thailand and some, ad some other uh, Southeastern Asian countries. What would you respond for that question? Or do you have the same question? Can I do missions? I cannot do nothing. I'm weak. You may guess this is the answer from 
you know, uh, uh, my dear friends. But you know what? These are the words from Jesus and Apostle Paul. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son cannot do anything. The son can do nothing by himself. In John 5, and again, John 5.30, by myself, I can do nothing. And Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 3, and he said, I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. Bruce Turker, the author of uh, From uh, Jerusalem to Iri and Jaya. Missionaries are just ordinary people, but our God is extraordinary. And he uses ordinary people to accomplish his extraordinary work. And this is uh, uh, Alan Black. He said, it is not with human power that God, people can do missions. It is not with human power that people can do mission, but it is through God who calls the people himself. This is how God works in his mission. This is how God works in his mission. We cannot do anything for his mission, but God can. And God is calling his people for his glorious mission. This is what we have to believe. So we have to come back again to this question. Can I do missions? And my personal answer is no, we cannot do. Surely you and I cannot, but who can? God can. God is calling us to join his glorious mission. He who begins the mission will also end it with us. This is what I believe. The good news is that there is an important role of God's people in God's mission to be obedient and to be faithful to his call. That we know our identity, that we are sent by Jesus and we are the witnesses to the end of the age, to every nation. And Christopher Wright, of course, we have to uh, remember his name in these days. And he said, but end of the age, mission is a matter of loyalty. And uh, my beloved you know, uh, mission theologian, David Bush, he said, God does not ask about the extent of our success. Many people are, you know, having and wanting success, but he's saying, however, rather we are asked about the depths of our commitment. God is not asking us to be successful. He's asking us to be obedient and giving depth of our commitment to his call. This is what we can do because mission doesn't belong to us. Mission belongs to God. What are Paul's ideas on who is and his mission for God's mission? And he is here is written 1 Timothy chapter 1, 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. At this point, many people are misunderstanding this passage, actually. People think that, oh, I'm qualified. I can do it. I'm able. I have authority. I have experience. I have some educational background. That's why God considered me trustworthy and he's appointing me to his service because I can do it. Actually, I will say no. I will find out something uh, three verses later. What Paul said, here is, here is a trustworthy saying that de deserve full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. He knew who he was. He is the worst sinner, yet he's so grateful that Jesus Christ considered him trustworthy. How can it be possible? And Jesus Christ, Christ appointing him to his servant. How can it be possible? It's not possible. That's why Paul is saying, in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 10. He's saying, but we have this treasure. We have this treasure where? 
in the jars of clay. Jars of clay is nothing. It's worthless. It's so easily breakable. So that this all surpassing power is not from me, not from us, but from God that people will know. And he says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body, which means we are the jars of clay that need to be broken to show that this, this treasure to the world. And sometimes we want to just keep this jars of clay as so precious. No, this is not the precious ones. This needs to be broken in order to show this treasure to the world. And this is what God's mission to us. And we are weak. We are vulnerable. That's the great thing that we know we need Jesus. We need his grace for doing his mission. And this is what uh, I like the story of Chronicles of Narnia uh, by C.S. Lewis. And there is a, a small lady called Lucy, and she heard of the king of Narnia, which is a lion. And she was asking, then he's safe? She was asking. Safe, said Mr. Bieber. Didn't you hear that Mrs. Bieber tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course, he is not safe, but he is a good and he's a king, I tell you. He's not safe. Mission is not safe, but we know that we have a good God, we have a faithful God, and he's a king who will begin and accomplish his mission with us. But mission is not safe. Isn't that true? And there is a saying that the boat is safer anchored at the port. Of course, it's a safer at the port because it's a bind. But there, that's not the aim of the boat. Boat was made for sailing, even though there is a big wave. But so many Christians I see, I know, they are worried of the big waves and they have some excuses of not sailing their boats because they are afraid of. Afraid of what? Afraid of their weaknesses. Afraid of their vulnerability. Afraid, afraid of their uh, lack of experience. Afraid of something and something and something and they are failed in sailing. And we are called to join God's mission, but there are always some big waves. This is what I call excuses. Of course, lack of finances that I experience when I mobilize, when I you know, uh, share this mission of God, that God is calling this grace journey with us together. And he's calling brothers and sisters from East Asian countries. And now is your turn. And they are always coming up with a financial problem. We are small, we don't have money. You know, how can we do missions? They are busy with their own interests. They are busy with their church works. They are busy with things and that and the projects they are thinking and things like that. But they are not interested in mission. And always lacking manpower. Always, always. They cannot send missionaries. They cannot send their young men and women to the mission field. Because they are lacking manpower in the church. There are lots of projects, lots of you know, uh, ministries in the church when they can find to sending their people the mission. And they say, do not know what to do for his mission. I don't know, I have no experience. I don't have knowledge. I don't have educational background. How can I do this and that and so on? And these are the excuses and big waves, of course. Good excuses, big good, uh, you know, uh, big waves, but I don't think it's an excuse. Because we have a clear picture of Revelation 7, 9. 
one day, God will come to his people. And there, before Jesus, we need to say yes to your call. I did. And I gave depths of commitment to you. I was faithful to your call. And you sent me to make disciples. I am here to be with you, with these people. All the nations, all the languages, all the tribes. Worshiping God. And nobody can say no. And this is what I believe. And you know, uh, I will share about some Global South mission movement. We know the Global South, the term Global South is uh, something we call Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Mission used to be, you know, one uh, direction, one way direction from west to east, from uh, Europe to Asia, maybe. Uh, from north to south, from America to, uh, uh, you know, Latin America or Europe to Africa. But now in this is mission from everywhere to everywhere. And Global South is the, the, the manpower that has a mission movement. And, uh, you know, this is Andrew Gim, who, was a, who is a mobilizer, who, who reported this, that he, uh, with the other mission agency in the church, in Global South churches, they sent over 5,000 short-term short -term missionaries and long-term missionaries from 50 countries to another 50 countries. They did world mission and $250 million they raised. Where from Global South? Can it be possible? Yes. He testified that this was possible. There will be endless possibility for God's mission among the nation from us. Endless, endless possibility. If we give five rolls of bread and two fishes, just small things that you know we bring to God, and He will do the miraculous things through us for His mission. And this is what I believe. And there are some other, you know, uh, 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 ways of doing world mission. Uh, Philippines, for example, we have a sister here, Philippines, and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, to encourage more believers to take part in the Great Commission through giving, the uh, mission organization provide coin cans for mission. Church members, young and old, find it a joy to fill the cans for mission. Those who had more could give more. They put in a bills instead of coins. Sunday school children were also encouraged to do drop their missions offering into coin cans. Other church members who were not well off still had the opportunity to share their resources through coins that accumulated over time. Some young people, they raised funds to support missionaries by washing this vehicle and cleaning houses together. They also organized a sacrificial dinner for missions and gave all the collective profits offerings for missions. This is what happened in Philippines. What about China? Uh, we know that China, they have a humble beginnings. The church grew in mostly agricultural states. The believers were not from rich background in general, so they fully trust in the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, when they are doing mission. Select the strategic gate city in the fields. Key cities, they have been selected in mission field, so set up mission, mission platforms and widely enhance their mission movement. They raised and investigated in future missionaries. They allot much of their finances and rep effort to developing future leadership. What about ministry oriented and efficient oriented like mission expo? When they have gathering, they encourage church leaders, mission leaders, businessmen, missionary candidates to come participate and interest with field missionaries so that they can share experience, insight, and resources to maximize their abilities. They do have a kingdom perspective on mission. They are collaborating, cooperating together, working together for God's mission. And Nietzsche market, you know, there is a, some area that traditional missionaries cannot do. They set up some, uh, you know, blue ocean 
and concentrate on ministries that they can do well. For example, you know, Chinese, they are very good at business mission. They are be very good at cooking. They're opening restaurants. They're opening cafes in the mission field and they are doing this business as mission. They have just do it spirit. They are not afraid of making mistakes and they finding their own ways, Chinese ways of mission. They know how, who they are. So they want to establish their, their own way of doing missions rather than copying from West or other missionaries. And we have some uh, Indian uh, brothers and one of the example from Northeast India mission movement. Northeast India, they give in midst of poverty. They give creatively. They have a heart for evangelization for their own nations at the same time reaching out all nations. They do mission as a whole community project. We have uh, one good example from Mizoram Presbyterian Synod in Northeast India. The Synod has deployed how many? 2,280 cross-cultural missionaries. Though the state is one of the poorest and remotest state in India, they offer firewood, a spoonful of rice for family members when they cook, and one out of every 10 chicken for mission. Many churches cultivate their own banana plantation and give all the profit for mission. They are proud of being able to export the gospel to other states and the nation. And one good example from Ethiopia. This is an emerging missionary nation in Northeast Africa. Ethiopia has a good number of evangelical uh, Christians in in February 2020, they started a mission agency to reach East Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East with the gospel and established also uh, a training center for training Ethiopian and global leaders. Ethiopian churches will mobilize their diasporic Christians in the region and will extend their ministry to other parts of Africa, the Middle East, Asia and beyond. One Ethiopian church pastor uh, shared this. We will support our missionaries through injera. This is a local food. The local church members will cook injera, sell that in the market and give the income for mission. Church members are not rich, but they would like to share the gospel to the Somalis and other through their own effort they try to find out possible resources in their context to support their missionaries and so on and so on and so on. There are so many stories from global South, from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And the global South mission is possible if we are committed, filled with the spirit and have a heart for mission. And we have to get out of the comfort zone and to go fear John and experiencing learning and growing together. And mission is a crossing border. It's not just a crossing border of the nation, crossing border of the comfort zone, crossing border of the fear John that we go because God who is sending us. And this is what we do in WEC, Acts 13. Uh, probably you have heard of, we have a one student from Ghana and uh, we are doing Act 13 in Ghana. Our goal is to have well-trained, spirit-filled African cross-cultural workers who will give it all for Jesus being sent out to the least rich globally. And we have one other um, mission uh, with WEG, IMM, International Mission Mobilization. And we do it because we know that this time is a mission from everywhere to everywhere. And this is the last verse with you for the first section. I'm sending you just as the father has sent me. And this sent, word sent is apostle led. And actually this is the word mission. We don't find mission in the Bible, but we find this word sending. And this is what we are, our identity. We are sent by Jesus. 
to make disciples for all nations. And this is, I want to share with you for this global south and uh, global mobilization uh, with you this time. Okay, so. Okay, thank you very much for your passion, um, the lectures um, in the first session, Sogwan. And uh, we're gonna have 10 minute break, uh, not 10 minutes exactly. So uh, it's 42 past two. So why don't you just come back in about eight minutes? So we'll be starting at um, uh, 2.50 shop, okay. all right? Then we'll be getting into second session, yeah? So I'll see you in about 10 minutes. Okay, see you then soon. See you soon. When you are focusing, there are things that you don't see. That's what it called in attentional blindness. In attention blindness of examples in the Bible, what about Israel? Their understanding of blessing. God called Abraham to make him blessing and to be a blessing for the old nations. And they hear, they saw this, they understand, they have the Bible, they have God. They believe that they are the person who have this message. But you know what? They missed big picture to be a blessing for all nations, even though they have it, even though they have a God, even, they, even though they have the Bible. And what about Jewish understanding of the Messiah? They missed Jesus. Jesus was walking on the street with them together. Every day, Jewish people saw Jesus and Jesus was telling that I am the son of God. I came here for the purpose even for the purpose of dying on the cross. They heard it, they saw it, but they missed it. What about you and your church? You're not experiencing an, an, an intentional blindness? There is a world paradigm shift. A paradigm is a standard perspective or a set of idea. A paradigm is a way of looking at something. But there is a one man, Thomas Kuhn, in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, he said, we need paradigm shift. And the world is experiencing paradigm shift. If we don't shift, if we don't have this experience, maybe people will remain the same. Remain the same that they want to see what they want to see. And there is man, David Bush, who is the author of Transforming Mission. And the uh, subtitle is The Paradigm Shift in Theology of Mission. We are missing a lot. When we, are, when we are doing mission, even, when we study about mission, we are missing a lot. And we need a paradigm shift in understanding of mission. And examples of paradigm shift we see this, uh, you know, uh, in, in Acts 10, when Peter had this experience of a Gentile. No, 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 I cannot do it for this. Even God was calling him. Peter denied. But what happened? He went to the Gentile's house and experienced the Holy Spirit came upon. And what happened? How can it be possible? Is the, is the God, Holy Spirit, walks on Jewish people only? Even among the Gentiles, he's walking. That's what he experienced in Acts 10. But later on, Acts 16, he's, he's having this whole change, paradigm shift. The man who persecuted Jesus became an apostle of Christ. It's a Paul. He is having paradigm shift. He knew that he was doing for God when he was persecuting churches and persecuting Jesus. But actually he saw what he wanted to see, not from God's perspective, his own perspective, he was doing that. And from that moment, when God is giving this experience of paradigm shift, having another perspective also on looking at mission, there is a lot of changes. So learning process is a good time to now 
when we learn something on your light, left hand side, you're learning something, learning something, and learning something, and we think that it is enough, especially uh, the seminary students like you and me, you know, when we are uh, learning and teaching, we learn something so much and we stop unlearning. And without unlearning, there is no process of relearning. And most of the people, they stop at the stage of learn and they don't unlearn. Therefore, they cannot relearn. And this time, I want to do it with you, unlearning process, so that we can acquire, we can gain another perspectives on mission. This is what I call relearn. There is nothing new under the sun, of course, and I'm sharing things that is there already given to us. Maybe it's not new for you, but probably on this, you know, as we are doing and we, as we are pro uh, practicing this, we, I hope that we have the experience of relearning. Okay, so uh, I will share about the reflection of mission. And I use these two words, process and power. As a uh, seminary student, you know these scholars like Arthur Glasser, David Howard, John Stott, Walt Kaiser, William Larkin. And they are not only mission scholars, they are New Testament scholars and Old Testament scholars. And all these scholars of a view that the central theme of the Bible is about mission. Did you think about the Bible is about mission? And therefore, it is the story of God's mission. And I hope this is the first stage of paradigm shift for all of us. Bible is not for me. Bible is not just giving me salvation and joy and hope. Bible is not the book that I read in during worship or my you know uh, quiet time. The Bible is about mission, and this is the story of God's mission. There is a book that I recommend you to read, The Mission of God, Unlocking the Bible's Grand Narrative by Christopher Wright. The entire Bible is generated by and is all about God's mission. We believe God is the missionary God. Mission is not primarily an active of the church, but an attribute of God. This is not just an action of the church or not just an action of God, but this is the attribute. This is the nature of God. God is the missionary God, David Bosch said. Mission is primarily and ultimately the work of tri triune God, creator and sanctifier for the sake of the world, a ministry in which the church is privileged to participate, David Bush said. Our missionary activity is not only authentic, are only authentic in so far as they reflect participation in the mission of God. And there is not just a movement of origination as God the Father sent Son and God the Father and the Son sent Holy Spirit. This is the mission, sending and being sent. And it's not just the movement of origination, the Trinity God, who is the missionary God, but it's also a movement of purposeful sending. There is a purpose of sending it. And this is what we call missionary God, who has the purpose of creation and new creation. There is two sentences. God has a mission versus God is the missionary God. When we call, when we say God is a mission, God has a mission, which means that it's one of the mission, one of the ministry that God is doing. God has so many business, and mission is one part. And even though we miss mission part, God is okay. God is there. That's what God has a mission. The mission may be incidental, disconnected from who God is. 
But God is the missionary God, which means that God, the nature, attribute of God is the mission. Mission is one of the perfection of God. And mission is the one that God himself. And that's God is the missionary God. I experienced in those days when we have some financial difficulties in the church, you know, those church, they are supporting missionaries. The first time when they have some financial difficulties and problem, where they cut off the finance? Mission, especially overseas missionaries. Because they are so busy with uh, the projects and ministry that they are doing in the church. So when they have money enough, then they do mission. But when they have less money or not enough, they are not doing mission. This is what we understand God has a mission. But if we understand God is the missionary God, whether we have money or not, whether we have people or not, whether we have experience or not, whether we have education or not, it doesn't really matter because God is a missionary God. We are doing mission. Mission is not just one of God's activities. Mission is God's nature. And God is the missionary God. At the same time, we see church as the missionary church. Christopher Wright said, it is insufficient to proclaim that the church of God has a mission in the world. Church of God has a mission in the world. That's what many people say. Church of God has a mission in the world. But he's saying, no, no, that's insufficient. The correct answer, correct sentence is the God of mission has a church in the world. God of mission has a church in the world. If it is not the church in God, in mission, it can never be a church. Let's let you begin. If God is properly described as a missionary, however, he can only be worshipped by a missionary church, by Stephen. The mark of a greatest church, great church is not its sending capacity, but its sending capacity. When we count the great church, when we, when we see great church, wow, it's great. I mean, people gathering together, worshiping God and so on. It's wonderful, isn't it? They are doing something. But it's not the mark of great church. According to Mark, the mark of great church is counting by its sending capacity because church is a missionary church. Same view, church is a mission versus church is a missionary church. You know, the origin of the church is, a mission, is, a, is an activity of the mission of God. The church became extent, existence through God's mission. It's a missionary work that plant a church before the church be the mission. So which comes first, mission or church? Mission always comes first. Without mission, there is no church. Without mission, there is no worship. Without mission, there is no Christian. The church is born by the activity of missionary who were sent by the missionary God. The church participates in the missionary nature of God. Therefore, the church is a missionary by nature. That's what we call church is a missionary church, not church, just church has a mission. If we say church has a mission, this is one of the ministry that we can, you know, delay. No, that's not possible. We cannot be separated church and mission because church by the nature is the missionary church. So identity and role of the local church, I say, community of mission. Community of mission is the identity and role. God has established a church for his mission. The church participates in God's mission. Church is the community of mission. The church as a missionary community is a core theme through the Bible, including both Old Testament and New Testament. Fundamentally, our mission, if it is biblically informed and validated, 
our mission means our committed participation as God's people is the right. At God's invitation and command, in God's own mission, within the history of God's world, for the redemption of God's salvation by Christopher Wright. The presence of God in the midst of God's people and the presence of his people in the midst of humanity, that's the mission. His presence in the midst of God's people and the presence of his people in the midst of humanity, the world. The mission of God includes God's people living in the way of God in front of the nations. So, mission is not primarily about going, nor is mission primarily about doing anything. Mission is about being, our identity. So it is not doing missionary work that makes me a missionary. Understand this? It is not doing missionary work that makes me missionary. I am missionary. That's why I'm doing mission. It's whole different. As you send me in the world, Jesus said, I have sent them into the world. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Origin of the term mission is from Latin mitre, to send. In Greek, apostolo means be being sent. Every Christian Every disciple, everyone who confesses Jesus Christ is the Lord, is sent by Jesus. Therefore, every Christian is a missionary. We go, we do mission, because that is what who we are, and we are being sent by our master, our God. So, if you have seen this uh, cartoon, uh, Latatui. Everyone can cook. This mouse was a cook. And uh, this movie shows that everyone can cook. And, stuff. and there is a you know, flight uh, company called Air Asia. And uh, their catching phrase is now everyone can fly. Anyone can cook. Everyone can fly. And I say, every Christian called to participate in God's mission. Everyone is a missionary. Everyone, every Christian is a missionary. And these two verses, very famous. I pick it up, these famous verses, because we, everybody knows about it. And I want to talk about this go and power. Matthew 28, 18, 20, and Acts 1, 8 provide a profound missionary commission and strategy. Matthew 28 provides us with an idea of the nature of God's mission and God's missionary strategy and methodology. And Acts 1 8 gives us understanding of missionary geographical and ethno ethnological mapping. And go. Can anyone deny that Jesus sent us go? Just go, go, go. And so many misunderstandings there when we are you know, hearing about go, going as trample teleportation or process. You know, uh, as a Korean missionary, I was living in Korea. Of course, I was in Central Asia, but just, uh, you know, uh, let me explain you. The Korea, uh, when I was in Korea, I was called to be a missionary to go to Thailand. So from A to B, from Th uh, Korea to Thailand, this is what I say, teleportation from A to B is the uh, moving from place A to B or mission as a process. It's mission as teleportation or mission as process. We see Jesus, his ministry. You know, he came as a baby, as God promised. Jesus came as a missionary, but he was born as a baby. He grew up as a child and he and he became an adult and he started his ministry and he's heading to cross and he had a clear purpose of being on the earth to die on the cross to give the salvation for all of the world that's the purpose isn't that true so if you 
uh, say go as a teleportation and go uh, uh, process as you go. Jesus is an example. Okay, mission. His mission is a redemption. And how he was doing his mission? In going. Actually, his mission was in going as you go. Process. It was the process, not teleportation from place A to B. Born as a baby, grew, tempted, at, drunk with the people, walked with disciples, healed and restored, and went to the cross. Mission-oriented. Jesus knew why he came and where he was heading. Jesus' mission was still a process on the road and completed on the cross. On the way, on the street, Jesus met so many people, but Jesus never rejected people who seemed to stop and block his way to cross. And this is what we are understanding of mission as process. Understanding about go in Greek, poriotentes. Go means here, go, and as you go. Two meanings at the same time. From place to another place is a go, but from place to another place, we need a process. As a missionary from Korea coming to Thailand, you know, I had to prepare something. I had to boast something. I had to, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, say goodbye to my church members and, you know, you know, those things. I, I had to pack up my bag. I had to bring my, you know, family and children. This is all process. If we're thinking of a mission as go from one place to one place, I wasn't, I, 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 I was not the missionary in Korea, but I am the missionary in Thailand. If we're thinking about, you know, teleportation as go. Because in Korea, I, I'm not the missionary. But if I, you know, take this, you know, go, then in Thailand, and I'm the missionary. But if we think mission as process, as you go, I was the missionary in Korea. I am the missionary in Thailand. But if I go anywhere on the street, in Korea, in Thailand, anywhere in Africa, anywhere in Asia, as I go, I do mission. Here, this go, when Jesus was saying, go and make disciples, means more than teleportation. It's a process. And as a process, I understand, when Jesus was doing his ministry, if Jesus was understanding mission as go from one place to another place, Maybe on the street, there are so many people nagging his leg and, you know, stopping his way and having meal together with them and so on. These are all, you know what? Blocking. Blocking his mission because mission is going from one place to another place. Place on the cross is the mission. We cannot say it. His mission was on the process, on the road. Even we move from one to A, and when we are there in the place of B, we must be ready to go. C, D, where God is sending and leading us even to the end of the earth. We go because our missionary God sent us. Purpose of go and in going as you go is to make disciples of Jesus. So, when we compare with go and as you go, teleportation and process, go is a one-time event. You are not missionary in Gambia. You are not missionary in India. But if you go to Korea, you are missionary. This is just a one-time event. And if you come back to India, if you come back to uh, 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 Gambia, what, what happened? You are not missionary because if you understand go as a mission, but if, as you go, if you understand as you go, go as you go is a lifelong process. You have mission identity and whatever you do is the mission. And God is calling to another country. That is the mission, overseas mission. You are doing mission in your own land. It's a lifelong process. If you understand go as a mission, 
is a result of moving. From A to B is a result of moving. If you don't go, you are not missionary. That's why we understand. That's why we call, oh, missionary. You are not missionary. You are Christian. You are what? Whatsoever. But if you understand go, go as you go, this includes process and progress. If you go as a missionary there, you need to live there and as a resident. But if you go as you go, you are foreigners and strangers. What are the difference, resident and foreigners and strangers? If you become resident, you become owner, owner of your ministry. Oh, this is my church. This is my ministry. This is my boundary. If there is a, someone coming up, don't come. This is my place. You need to have a permission. I am a resident. I am the owner of doing this. The attitude. But if you're living as a foreigner and strangers like you, seminary students, you are living as a foreigner and strangers, what happened to you? You don't feel owner. You are not owner, even for yourself. You always feel vulnerability. You always feel weak. So what happened? You go and ask help. Asking help is nothing wrong. We need to help each other. We need to, you know, building a community of help and serving each other. That's what God is calling us together as a community. Strangers. You are foreigners. What happened? You don't speak their language well. You don't know about their culture. Then what? Your attitude must be very humble. Isn't that true? Humiliation comes up, but you know that you are the servant. You are not the owner. You have the servant. You have the owner that you are acting as a servant. And you are weak. As God called you to be weak. And I will explain you more about it. And we have, said, we have uh, uh, noticed that Apostle Paul said, as I'm weak, I'm strong. You know, you are foreigners and strangers as you go. And identity. If you think about mission as go, you must go. If you don't go, you are not missionary. Your identity always uh, coming from your action. But you know what? If you think mission as you go, it doesn't really matter whether you're going or not. Your identity is missionary wherever you are. Where I am, here and now, I am doing mission. I am a missionary. And broom where you planted. This is what our identity. And if you, if you think mission as go, it's only some special people can do mission. There are very few people, very special, very educated, very experienced, very you know, uh, uh, experts can do mission. But is that God is you know, doing his mission with his people? I don't think so. God is calling every Christian, everyone who believes in Jesus, even the small ones and older ones, women and men, doesn't really matter. Every Christian who are called and sent by, you don't need to be very special because you are so special. You understand this? You are unique. You are just one person in the world. You can do things that only you can do. No one can do it, but only you. And that, there your mission is. There God's mission through you. So uh, you understand why I want to compare with this go and as you go. Understanding go and make disciples. If we understand go, that makes all trouble. And you know, uh, so far, so many people understood mission as go, but from now on, I hope that you will understand mission as you go, as you go, as you walk through, as you walk through the corner of the street, 
you are the missionary. You do the mission there in Korea. You do the mission wherever you are, in the place where God is calling you. And second thing, mission is power. Acts 1a says, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. That's what we understood. And power, we kind of thinking of some mysterious, you know, uh, experience that God is giving me power, something that, you know, whether, whenever I am weak and, you know, vulnerable, God is giving me power to, to uh, you know, do it, you know. You know, power, when we understand power, usually when people have power, what they do with the power, they use it to control others. In Luke 22, Jesus said, the king of Gentiles lorded over them, which means that when they have a power, you know, they will lord it over. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. They give beneficiaries to others who has no power, which means that when they have power, they exercise this power over the people. And sometimes they control. And many times, actually, I find that power has a po uh, uh, the, the means of control. And you know, funny things that in Mark uh, chapter 9, 33, 34, they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, Jesus asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? And they kept quiet because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. You know what this passage is talking about power. I want to have more power. I want to sit in front of, uh, in the right hand side of Jesus, left hand side of Jesus. I am the greatest. I am the great. I have more. I want to have more power. God, give me more power that I can do it. I can practice more. Why they want to do it? I, why I want to have this, you know, power? They want to control. They want to be the greatest. Power tend to corrupt. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Power is addictive. Scientists claim that power has almost identical effects to cocaine. Power and control are so intoxicating. In fact, that they can be considered to be addictive. And there are many power and control addicts in the world. And we know that when people have power, they use this power to control. Isn't that true? I cannot say everyone, but I say most of the people, when they have power, they want to have more power because they are addicted. And they want to have this power to control over. But I know one man there was one who was almighty, but became nothing. He gave every power that he had. He made himself nothing, nothing. And he said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came not to be served, but to serve. David Bush said, God gave us power, not as power to control, but as power to be weak. Isn't that great? He, God, knows that we want to have more power. Why? To control. But God gave us power not to control, but to be weak. But made himself nothing, take the very nature of a servant and become obedient to death, even death on the cross. For I am weak when I am strong, 2 Corinthians 12. And many, even among the Christians, they say, oh, when we show our weaknesses, we become loser, you know, we are failure. And this makes us humiliation. 
and probably God doesn't like it. And we cannot glorify God. God is dishonored through our weaknesses. That's why we want to have more power. We want to practice. We want to have more success. I understand this passion for you know, bringing glory to God. But it shouldn't be excused that we want to have more power because I want to be more strong. Our weaknesses is not making us as loser. As Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. And I know that when I'm weak, mission prosper. When I'm strong, I do the mission what I want to do. I want to do the mission what I want to do. I am the owner. And I don't want to listen what God is asking. God is sending. Because I have enough. And I will share again. David Bush. Second time. Because it's important. God does not ask of us about the extent of our successes. Rather, we are asked about the depth of our commitment. So the personal reflection on mission. Mission is not just going from one place to another place, but mission is a process of as you go, going, having this identity as a missionary. Wherever you are, whatever you do, you are the missionary. And serving others through the power that God has given you. When the power is on you, we have more responsibility of serving. We have more responsibility of sharing. We have more responsibility of loving. So mission is not about me, what I'm doing, but it's all about God. Mission is not where I want to go, but where God wants. Actually, for my wish, I don't want to go back to Korea. I want to stay in the mission field because I have, long, I, I have lived long enough here. It's more familiar. When I go back to Korea, so much discomfort, difficulties, and challenges. I don't want to go. But if it's the mission God is calling me to go back and sending me home, then I must go because mission doesn't belong to me. It is where God wants. Mission is not what I want to do, but God wants. I see many people that they want to do something in the mission. And I'm wondering whether this is what God wants them to do. Mission is not what I, I can, but this is what God will. I can, but I cannot. And most of the time I found that I cannot do. What I am asked to do I cannot do with my ability. I'm not qualified. But this is what God will. And God is calling me to do it. And he's asking not to be successful in that, but to give my faithfulness and obedience. Mission is not about success, but faithfulness, royalty. Mission is not for there and later, but here and now. As we're thinking about mission, as you are going, wherever you are. So I think this is what I want to share with you today. The first lesson and second lessons, the reflections and you know, understanding of mission from my own perspectives. And I hope this is a small paradigm shift. And I want you to study more about mission of God because as we understand God is a missionary God and God is calling us as missionary. 
And this is the reason, there are lots of reasons that we have to study about him as a missionary, isn't that? So thank you so much for uh, giving your attention for these lessons in this very tiring afternoon. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, 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 share about your ideas and thought and also your questions. If there is anything that I can answer for you, I'm not quite sure anyways. Okay, so this is all about. Okay, so this is um, time for the um, question and answer. So if you, uh, if you want to ask any questions, just feel free to ask questions to um, Sogwan. Yeah. 